I am joined today by Gerald Grove. Gerald was born and raised in Centralia. He graduated from the University of Missouri with a master's degree in 1977. And then he went to work for IBM and worked there uh, for more than 30 years. During his time at IBM, he lived in St. Louis, Kansas City, Dallas, and Tulsa. Uh, Gerald, you should be able to uh, answer the barbecue debate living in all those cities. And Tulsa yeah. is where he lives now. He has two kids, Ashley and Jeremy. And full disclosure, Jeremy, who currently lives in Tokyo with his wife and three kids, is a good friend of mine. And it's because of Jeremy that I was introduced to Gerald and also introduced to Ronald, who is the topic of conversation here today. Um, so, uh, Gerald, I want to really thank you for being here with me today. My let's, pleasure, Tom. Let's talk about your dad. And first of all, how did he end up in the Army Air Corps in World War II? Tom, um, as I think uh, most people read from the past, uh, historical accounts of U.S. Uh, youngsters, if you will, the 18-year-olds, um, once Pearl Harbor was attacked, they all felt a sense of duty to, to join. And in my dad's case, uh, there were six brothers, two younger than him, and then three older. And the three older brothers had already joined the um, uh, Air Transport Command through the U.S. Um, Air Corps at that time, back in 1940. And so dad felt obligated. And right after his 19th birthday, he joined. Okay. Well, um, he ended up as a tail gunner in a B-17 in the Army Air Corps. How did he get to that point? Um, he actually began, Tom, as a, a ball turret gunner and um, aircraft mechanic. That was his training in the first um, nine months to year of his enlistment. Um, and then when the crew was formed in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, in uh, November of uh, 1943, um, Dad was, in fact, the, assigned as that ball turret gunner on the Max Edward Wilson crew. Um, unfortunately, somewhere in the, the following 30 days or so, the original tail gunner, a gentleman named uh, Chester Mazur, was reassigned. And so the gentleman that, that backfilled uh, to make a complete crew of 10 uh, indicated he would only fly in the ball turret position. Uh, so the, the pilot, uh, command pilot, Max Wilson, asked Dad, if he'd mind moving to the tail, and that's exactly how he became the tail gunner. Dad said, I'll be shooting wherever I am, so I'll go to the tail. Did, did your dad ever, uh, did he ever talk to you about that move? Was it something that uh, he really didn't mind, or was he a little apprehensive about it? I know the ball turret was, was one of the most dangerous positions on the B-17. And, and yet, uh, interestingly, in your comments there, Tom, Dad, Dad didn't mind it at all. He said... Um, in either position, you were pretty well isolated, whether you're at the very tail of the, of the uh, B-17 or whether you're in the ball. And he indicated that when you look at statistics, you actually find out the ball turret gunner, of all things, was the safest on the B-17 because of his small enclosure, the armor around it, and the balled-up position he was in throughout the, the fighting. Uh, Dad had no qualms about flying in the tail. And that, in fact, on their um, first mission, he was asked to move into the ball turret after the uh, ball turret gunner uh, passed out due to lack of oxygen. So dad actually did spend a little time in the ball turret um, uh, during their first mission. OK, um, now you you sent me uh, a few months ago a very interesting thing that you wrote up, kind of a narrative of your dad's time in service. Um, I, I really want to encourage you to someday write a book because the information you had in there was just fascinating to me and I think it's history that we don't want to lose. Um, you talk about how he got to England with his with his crew on his B-17 which which is just fascinating um, but I want to I want to kind of jump ahead that he was stationed in Horham in the UK and on his fourth mission I want, to, I want to talk about his fourth mission. Can, can you go into some details about that? Sure, sure can, Tom. Um, uh, the fourth mission uh, was a little unusual for the 95th Bomb Group to whom uh, Dad's, uh, Dad's crew belonged um, and the 335th Bomb Squadron. Um, normally, um, groups, uh, bomb groups, would fly uh, attached to a combat wing. And those combat wings were made up of, of three groups. In the, in the 95th case, they normally flew as the 13th combat wing based in Horham. 
um, and it was the 95th, the 100th, and the 390th bombers. This particular mission to Friedrichshafen, Germany, on the 24th of April of 1944, they were actually assigned to the 45th B combat wing, um, and that was um, uh, they were flying with the 388th bomb group, which was leading. Uh, the 94th bomb group was in the high position, and the 95th filled the low position. So it was a little unusual arrangement uh, on that mission to begin with. The second piece that was unusual is that this was the first time that the Max Wilson crew weren't um, the same 10 guys. The bombardier, a gentleman named George Prokopek, and shortened after the war to Peck, uh, had developed uh, sinusitis and was grounded for the mission. So a gentleman named John Zedzi, uh, who was on his 22nd mission, filled in uh, as what they refer to as a toggleer. So he would he would release the bombs on the signal from the lead plane, and he filled that 10th slot when George was grounded. Um, on this mission, uh, the, the B-17s were split the, in terms of this large formation of some 800-plus bombers. Uh, one, uh, one great big wing going to Oberfaffenhofen, in uh, the, a little north of where Dad and their group were bombing in Friedrichshafen. And it was uh, quite a great air battle for the group that went to Oberhofenhofen. Um, and in, in Dad's case, they had some fighter interception, but not as much as the other groups did. Um, on the mission, on the way over, uh, the B-17 that they'd flown in, uh, serial number 4231632, with a radio trans mission code of Z for zebra, uh, they started uh, overheating a cylinder in one of their engines, and that, that engine had to be shut down, or if you will, the, the uh, propeller feathered, uh, so they could remain with the group and have to increase power on the other engines. As they just crossed the border from France into uh, Germany, uh, coming in from the north, um, a, a, there was a fighter pass made. It was only made by about a half dozen Focke-Wolfs, but one of the planes came through a uh, head-on pass uh, through the group and the uh, squadron with which Dad was flying, and a 20-millimeter uh, shell hit their number two engine and literally exploded the engine, uh, knocking it loose in the nacelle, and that effectively put them down two engines because now they had number one engine, which was the one that was feathered, uh, due to the overhead overheated cylinder, and the second engine, number two, also on the left side, was now non-functional and, and had caught fire briefly, and then it went out. Uh, at that point, they had to leave the formation. They only had two engines left and a full load of bombs. Um, as they got into Germany near Friedrichshafen, uh, the Tagelier released the bombs uh, because they were still losing altitude. And it was about this time that uh, as the flak had come up, in France, and as they got into Germany, there was um, uh, some damage to a fourth engine, uh, and they were having to shut it down as well, which uh, uh, when you have a four-engine airplane and you're down to basically one real engine functioning and a little bit of another one, uh, you're certainly not going to fly much longer, and your gliding characteristics become somewhat like a rock. So they were certainly um, out of the fight, and uh, that's when Max and, and uh, Felix Kowalczyk, the co-pilot, uh, called for fighter support. And P-38s from the 364th Fighter Group came down to um, assist them as they were headed down, but still under control. Um, that day was, was uh, a day in which the 95th uh, did lose two of its aircraft. Uh, both ended up in Switzerland. Uh, the Wilson crew B-17 uh, crash landed first. As they were um, heading out of Germany, back, if you will, to the um, to the west, knowing that they wouldn't make it back to England, but trying to find some safe haven, uh, as opposed to um, uh, becoming prisoners of war, uh, they were able to plot a course that would take them across into Switzerland, which uh, would be a neutral country, uh, yet the, they still had several dangers of not only a crippled aircraft, but of course uh, a lot of mountains, i.e. the Alps, there in Switzerland to navigate. As they um, went across Lake Constance, which separates Switzerland from Germany on the east uh, and Austria, uh, a Swiss fighter uh, came up and joined them. Uh, Swiss identified by a, um, 
a, a red flag, if you will, with a white cross on it. Uh, the the uh, fighter aircraft came up from uh, the rear low, so Dad had the first shot at him, but realized it wasn't a German aircraft. The pilot came up by the tail, waggled his wings, and began pointing down. Uh, Dad said he indicated with his thumb that the fighter needed to move to the front of the airplane, uh, which he did. The fighter flew up alongside Max, uh, the pilot, and indicated they needed to go down and land and uh, pointed them toward um, uh, a, an airfield there in Dubendorf, Switzerland, uh, and again motioned for them to go down by lowering his wheels. Uh, from that point forward, Max and uh, Felix uh, could see the airfield. Uh, they were lining up to come in, but again, they knew they'd have only one shot at this because with one engine functioning only, they would not be able to go around. Uh, as they came in, Max could see that um, it was going to be a grass strip landing. He had hopes that it would be a, a reasonably smooth landing, uh, but it would be short because it was a fighter airfield. Uh, as they got closer and closer, uh, uh, Felix and Max were both working the controls. They were a little bit high, and Max pushes it down on the control stick. And as soon as they touch uh, the left main landing gear, which was probably damaged by the 20-millimeter um, cannon fire of that Focke Wolf, that left main landing gear collapsed. And as soon as that happened, the left wing dipped, hit the ground uh, quite hard, knocking number one and number two engines completely loose from the wing. Uh, that sent the airplane into a left hand or a port turn uh, with no control um, uh, by Max or, or Felix. They were at the uh, they were basically at the mercy of whatever inertia was going at the time, and that skidded them over to their left toward a radio tower, which um, was not going to move, and it didn't. And their B seventeen ultimately slammed into that radio tower and a. Uh, a radio shack that was next to it, a wooden, a wooden structure. And that's how they stopped. It's the whole story is fascinating. And uh, probably one of the most fascinating pieces of this for me is the fact that you found video of that airplane crash landing at that airfield. And you sent that to me. I've seen it. I'm going to try to insert that in right here on this interview. Um, okay. But it's just fascinating to me that you, you were able to find that. Can you explain to us how that happened? Sure can, Tom. And I, I'd be the first to tell you that uh, uh, I get goosebumps every time I think about that because, um, uh, as I mentioned to you, a, as a little boy, I, once Dad explained how, the, how his war had gone, I just knew in my, in my spirit, I knew I would know more about this crew and what they did. I didn't know how or when. I was six but um, uh, finding that video clip uh, was just a, basically a miracle of coincidence. I'll put it that way. Um, I, I, through Dad's joining of the Swiss Internees Association and the 95th Bomb Group, um, veterans groups, um, I knew that there was going to be a, a broadcast by a BBC uh, documentary filmmaker, and it was entitled Whispers in the Air. Uh, it was to talk about aircraft and crews that crashed in, in neutral countries, such as Switzerland and Sweden in World War II. And when that was on, I mentioned to Dad, let's be sure we're watching it together. I set the VCR up in my home, uh, and I just moved to Tulsa at that time. So 1990, the, the uh, documentary began with a fighter pilot from the 361st Fighter Group, Urban Drew, talking about escorting bombers. And as he was talking about this, um, up comes this video of this airplane coming down. And I can see on the tail, it's got a, a white square, which is what the B uh, was in. That's, that's how you identified the 95th bomb group, uh, square B. And I could see it coming down. And as soon as it touched, the landing gear on the left side collapsed. The engines flew up into the air. You could see that dust and debris were flying. And then you saw it begin to slant toward a radio tower, and ultimately it, it hit it in a cloud of dust, and that stopped it. And when I saw that, I thought, my gosh, that's, that's eerily similar to exactly what my dad and Max Wilson and other crewmen had described to me on the phone. And um, that's how it came about seeing the video, and from that point, 
I simply began writing letters to the BBC um, and then to the Swiss, uh, uh, Swiss Armed Forces as well as the Swiss Air Museum. And that's how we connected and the Swiss were willing to sell me um, that video clip uh, of Dad and Max's uh, plane crash. And it was about a 30 second video end to end. So that's the short version of what happened. It's the whole story. And we should say that the whole crew walked away from the crash. Uh, I think there was maybe one concussion, if I remember right, from one of the crew members. Right, Tom. There were, there were various bumps and bruises as most of the crew were in the radio room pre preparing for a crash landing. But Felix Kowalczyk, the uh, co-pilot, uh, suffered a very severe concussion because at the, on the back of the uh, seats uh, for the pilot and co-pilot was armor plating. And when they hit, that, that collapse of that gear threw uh, Felix's head back into that metal um, armor plating and he didn't have a helmet on of any kind. So he had a very severe concussion that in fact, um, at times he would either black out or, or he, he would lose his vision for several months thereafter. So um, that would have been the most serious injury, but all of them walked away. And uh, as Max uh, would tell you, he said, um, you know, we jumped out windows, uh, the, the, the pilot's window and, and Felix jumped out the co-pilot's window, which are very small. And they were smaller guys at that time. But he said, I really couldn't tell you how we did it. I just know we saw fuel spilling out of the wings and hot engines, and we were waiting for it to explode. So uh, we just jumped out those, those small windows with our flight gear on, and we made it and fell to the ground. Wow. The rest of the crew, rest of the crew went out through the um, uh, waste door at the back. And uh, uh, I guess, by, by, again, by good fortune, um, Felix, uh, being of Polish descent, uh, could speak Polish, and one of the guards from the, the Swiss Armed Forces also spoke Polish, and that's how they communicated to understand they had, in fact, crashed in Switzerland, and it was not German territory. Well, and that brings us to a whole other topic um, of the, the Swiss internment camps. Now, I'll be honest with you, until I met your son Jeremy years ago, and he told me about uh, your dad, his grandpa being a tail gunner in a B-17, I had no idea that there were Swiss internment camps during World War II. And um, I've since learned a lot about those. And they were no holiday by any means, but it was a place where uh, these bomber crews that had crash landed, that had ended up in Switzerland would go. And can you explain why there were Swiss internment camps? I think I can. Um, effectively, if you want to try to put your mind around this concept of, of the neutrality of Switzerland, uh, in every war that had existed up through World War II, the Swiss had always determined to, to remain neutral and stay out of political conflicts. That was the claim. <clears throat> in the, the case of World War II, um, there were some 1,600 plus uh, American um, internees there, um, and all of them came in in different ways um, in terms of the, the Air Force. Uh, but most of them either parachuted or had a crash landing, such as, uh, such as the Wilson crew. Um, the internment camps began with just one, and it was in a hotel. And as luxurious as that might sound, the, the, the thing that wasn't well known and still isn't is that these hotels were stripped. Uh, cots were brought in for men to sleep on. Um, there was no hot water, and they basically decommissioned the hotels and took all the furnishings out, and that's where they would hold these prisoners, these neutral uh, prisoners or internees. <clears throat> and it, w it mattered not whether you were American or English or um, German. It, it made no difference. They were to intern all of them. By the same token, I, I've always likened this to, well, the next-door neighbor of Switzerland was Germany. And I think it would be very reasonable to say from, from what I've read that it was a little easier for the Germans to slip back across the Swiss border into Germany than it was for British or English to try to get out of Switzerland. So the, uh, the Allied side were pretty well um, corralled, if you will, and they were put in, this, um, in these hotels in, in the case of Dad and the Wilson crew. It began in Edelboden, Switzerland, which was high in the Alps. It had normally been a resort town because there was only one road in and one road out. So they had very, uh, the, the Swiss had a, um, 
natural way of controlling access uh, in or out, and they could keep the uh, Allies under guard without barbed wire, but certainly with Swiss armed forces uh, able to monitor the um, the the uh, internees and every move that they made during the daylight hours. And uh, so your dad was, um, he ended up there. He got moved around a few times. Mm -hmm. And where, what was his last location as an internee? The, the last location was in Wengen. That's W-E-N-G-E-N. -E -E it's a little lower in the Alps, but uh, still in the same um, area of, of, of Switzerland. Uh, the pilots uh, and the officers, so that would have been the navigator, pilot, and co-pilot, had been separated from the crew in um, uh, in in the summer of 1944 and sent into southern Switzerland in an area known as Davos Plots, uh, closer to Italy, if you will. Um, the enlisted man continued to be split between Edelboden and Wengen. Dad uh, was moved to Wengen in um, August of 44. And that's where uh, that's the location from which he and another uh, another one of the American um, internees escaped effectively, uh, not from Wingen specifically, but that was their uh, internment camp from which they uh, launched their escape attempt. Now, I, I remember uh, several years ago, I got to spend some time with your dad and he was telling me about his whole story. And I remember him uh, talking about his time as a Swiss internee and I remember him telling me that he got a little piece of bread to eat every day and he was starving. And at some point he decided it was time to go. And can you talk about his decision to escape and how that happened? Yep. Um, you know, a lot of little things play into those memories, Tom, that, that you're bringing up uh, as dad would describe his time. And I think, uh, the things that I that I remember from my childhood were there were there were three three particular uh, types of food that my dad just could not tolerate. And oddly enough, after I learned more about his time in the service, I understood why. Those three types of food were tuna, um, and oatmeal, and goat cheese. And the main reason was because those were the kind of uh, foods that uh, made up the staple diet. Uh, that dad remembered from his time of being an internee. Now, um, a as much as it might have been troublesome to get food in Switzerland, and certainly you'd rather be an internee than a prisoner of war where there was barbed wire around you at all times, uh, food was still scarce. Um, the Nazis and all of the uh, wartime um, challenges they presented to the continent of Europe certainly didn't spare Switzerland either. And of course, being a high mountainous country, uh, farmland was not um, uh, something that you found every few hundred yards. So the Swiss people were also uh, suffering from um, a lack of food supplies. Uh, because of those kinds of things, uh, Dad went from about 145 pounds, 150, to uh, when he was returned to the States after his escape, uh, he was down to about 105. So he lost some 40 pounds that he probably didn't have to lose um, just based on lack of food. And again, it was the Swiss people weren't, um, weren't hoarding it. They, there just wasn't a lot of food to be had. So he, um, at, he was there, I think he was an internee for seven months. Uh, it was a little closer to nine months, Tom, but okay. um, the way he got to the decision, I think was a combination of factors. I think uh, a, a piece of what you said about dad being hungry I think another piece was boredom was a huge challenge uh, for POWs and internees because there really wasn't something to do. And that's where uh, the Americans uh, were smart enough through organizations and the American legation uh, out of Bern to um, to put together educational classes, um, some music, uh, musical classes, uh, sporting events, if you will, baseball, which uh, they are, I should say softball which dad was very well involved in. Boredom was a, a huge piece of, of what they fought, if you will, uh, once they were interned. And it, uh, it was clearly the same for prisoners of war. The difference being prisoners of war had barbed wire fences holding them. Internees were guarded by the Swiss, openly allowing them to walk around in the, in the village where they, the hotel existed that, that held them. But they certainly weren't, uh, weren't free by any stretch. 
and they had curfews in the evenings, those sorts of things. So <clears throat> the American legation in Bern and, and the Americans and the Allies and their, their organized military approach to the war at least provided an opportunity to have classes designed and, and got musical instruments and um, uh, they created a few bands. Uh, Americans played softball and baseball and uh, football, of which dad was very involved. And that's how they tried to fight the boredom. But ultimately, the lack of freedom and, and the training that uh, each one of these internees had had um, of trying to get back to allied lines kicked in. And so about about six months, seven months into it, dad was beginning to say, I've got to find a way out. Uh, by the time, I guess, um, they got to the later part of November, so I guess you, you're right, it was probably closer to about seven months, six, seven months, um, <clears throat> They, um, he, and a dad, and uh, two close friends, a gentleman named uh, Frank Cherry, uh, who later changed his name back to the Italian Cereso, and another friend um, uh, that they that they had met, who was an internee, Walter Wisniewski from the 92nd Bomb Group, were, were visiting one day, and Dad said, "We got to go. Why don't the three of us go?" And um, Walt and 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 Frank were kind of hesitant to do that because they all knew that um, that there was a camp. There were actually two or three camps, but the most notorious in Switzerland was, Switzerland was called Valvillermus, and um, it was a lot more like a prisoner of war camp. Um, barbed wire fences, guard dogs, um, the whole bit with, with limited sanitary facilities, even more limited food. And it was designed to hold prisoners who tried to escape or who had done some, uh, had created, had, done, had become a criminal in some fashion, according to the Swiss uh, government. And so they knew that if they were caught, um, uh, that was a real possibility where they would end up spending several months. Uh, Dad basically said, um, don't care, still got to get out of here, time to go. So the three of them were talking in the in Vingen in the, the hotel, the, the Palace Hotel, one morning in the lobby. And um, a gentleman named Joe Piemonte, who, who had been on a Virgil Broyhill's crew with the 384th Bomb Group, coincidentally shot down the same day, the 24th of April, and very coincidentally, a ball turret gunner overheard dad and Frank and um, Walt talking. And Joe said, well, I speak Italian and uh, fluently, and that might be helpful. I'm certainly ready to go. So Ron, if you want to go, let's do it. Um, from that point, they co connected with the, what would be thought of as an escape committee uh, who figured out ways to most easily escape without getting caught. And, um, the way they did that was through a dental visit because the internees were allowed one dental office visit per year. Um, and so that was the method that they would use. And um, it was as complicated, but very simple. It was, um, they would be taken by guard to uh, Frutigen in Switzerland. Um, and that's where the dentist's office was. They would be given a, a ticket, a pass. They would go back to the dentist's office uh, one would, the other internee would be out in the waiting room with a Swiss guard. Dad went first, went back to the dentist's office. The examination was done. During this time, my dad was doing a slow count to try to get a sense of the timing. How long did it take to have his teeth examined? When, they, when he finished, he went back out to the waiting room to give the ticket or the pass uh, to Joe Piemonte. And um, then Joe went back for his dental exam. As dad was sitting in the waiting room with the Swiss guard, he waited till about half the time he thought he had been in the dentist chair. He asked to go to the restroom facilities. Um, that restroom was about halfway between the, the waiting room and the dentist's uh, office. Uh, he went back to the, the uh, bathroom. Joe finished um, his uh, dental exam. He met dad at the bathroom. They left the pass on the counter. And the two of them went out the back door of the dentist's office without the, uh, the guard knowing. And some five or six minutes later, the uh, dentist came out into the waiting room asking the uh, Swiss guard, were there any other prisoners uh, that needed to be uh, examined? At that point, obviously, the guard realized he was missing two prisoners. And um, by that time, they had a good head start. Their intent was to get on a train and to try to get um, 
uh, to the border between Switzerland and France toward Geneva. As they were walking toward the rail station, a gentleman walked up on the sidewalk in front of them, uh, spoke very plain English. He indicated he was a Canadian and with the underground uh, there in Switzerland, um, said, uh, we know that you are two uh, internees planning to escape. The Swiss also know that. The armed forces do. They are waiting you at the rail station. You can continue as you as you wish, and they will certainly capture you there. They might trade you for German prisoners, or they may send you to Walvillermoose, but they know that you are trying to escape, and they know you're going to the rail station. If you want to get away, a car is going to pull up in about a block and a half. It'll pull right against the curb. There will be an, a, a Frenchman driving. There's an English woman in the back. Uh, I'll need you to jump into that car. You will change clothing. They will take you to the American legation in Bern, and we'll get you out another way. And that's how their um, uh, escape attempt altered from their original plan. They did jump in the back of the car. They did change clothes, uh, made it through a couple of roadblocks, and did get to, to Bern, Switzerland, which is where the American legation and embassy were located. Uh, they were told they would need to run into the embassy from the car. The car would not stop, but would slow. And they were still on Swiss soil until they got inside the American legation building. Uh, they, that they did. Uh, the legation did some debriefing and discussing um, how they would get out from there. Uh, Joe and dad spent the night in the legation sleeping on the floor. The next morning, um, some individuals from the French underground took uh, Dad and Joe, and they began uh, a, a good lengthy walk out of Bern, uh, across a, a levee, uh, a dam, if you will, across one of the lakes, into a wooded area. Uh, Dad indicated he and Joe, the only time they really experienced what they called fear was as they were walking into the woods where they were to rendezvous with a, a man in a truck and a trailer, they heard dogs barking, and that's when the two of them thought, uh-oh, they actually know we're out here trying to get away, and there are dogs chasing us. It ended up being a farmer out hunting, um, but certainly gave them a little fright for a moment. A little deeper into the woods, a gentleman uh, came up in a truck with a trailer. Uh, the trailer had a number of crates on it. Um, those crates were for carrying farm goods and farm animals. Uh, he made a tunneled area where Joe and Dad could... Uh, lay down, and he told them, don't smoke, don't speak, be as absolutely quiet as you can, and I'm going to get you um, to the uh, uh, Lake uh, Lake Geneva or that area, and uh, then we'll have both the French uh, underground, uh, of which he was a member, uh, turn you over to the Polish underground and get you across uh, that small lake area and um, into France. Um they did just that. Uh, Dad did remember they stopped at one or two checkpoints uh, and crates were moved around, but they did not discover Dad and Joe, obviously. Um, that evening, because they did take back roads, they did arrive at a small lake off of the edge of Lake Geneva. Um, they were put in a rubber raft. Um, the the uh, Polish underground picked them up at that point, took the raft uh, out into the lake, got most of the way across then dad and joe were told they'd have to walk in the water uh the rest of the way which they did and as dad reminds us uh november water is really cold in switzerland mm, yeah and so they got out of the rubber raft and uh, were picked up at that point by the french underground again taken to a home about a mile and a half uh, off the lake and an older uh, couple uh took care of giving them some food and uh drying dried clothes and, and gave them a place to stay for the night. And the next morning, uh, a, an officer and an MP from uh, Patton's army uh, picked them up to take them to Annecy, France, which was the uh, location of the debriefing facility for the Allies at that point, since um, the Allies had moved up uh, after the invasion of, uh, of Normandy and after the invasion of south, southern France. Remind us how old your dad was when he went through all this. Uh, Dad was 19 when he uh, when he joined and, and for the first year of his service, and uh, he had just turned 20 uh, when all the escape uh, activity took place because his birthday was in uh, the middle of August. 
it's it's hard to imagine a 20 year old going through this and and doing what he did amazing well tom i'd, I'd simply say that one of those highlights beyond that uh that video footage and beyond finding the original picture of the plane crash uh, uh, that was in a, a Lynn Morgan book called Crack Up. That was the first real break. The, the other thing that to me has always been special was the opportunity to take Jeremy back uh, uh, to uh, follow his grandfather's footsteps. And, and, and the beauty of that was I was able to do it when my son was the same age as his grandfather. And I think that really impressed Jeremy as well to realize as a sophomore in college, uh, with not a care in the world, he was walking and, and, and trotting in those steps of a, a frightened American trying to get home. And uh, that, that was a special time. I know for sure it was a special time for Jeremy because he, he has told me more than once about that trip that you and, that you and he got to take over there. Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the things, so your dad did, he got back to the UK eventually and he was told that he couldn't get back uh, on a B-17 as the tail gunner. And why was that? Tom, the, 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 the amazing part of World War II would be the escape and evasion networks, the French underground, the uh, Dutch underground, Belgian underground, all of these people who risked their lives and torture, quite honestly, from the Nazi regime. Um, if, you, if you were an airman and these people were kind enough and brave enough to help you get out. The biggest concern was if, in fact, any of those routes and those people were exposed, um, the torture that they would have to endure would be unbearable. And so the point of the Americans and the Allies was once you've been shot down, the Germans know you have been on the continent. So th the short story from there is um, the, the Americans decided that if you were shot down and then escaped or evaded, you would not be allowed to go back and fly over the European continent because you didn't, the American government did not want to expose those helpers to what could happen if they were exposed to the uh, Germans if you were shot down again. Uh, as a result, dad was given an option. He could, since he couldn't fly any longer in the uh, European theater of operations, he could either be part of the ground um, echelon there at Horum and serve out the remainder of the war, or he could go back to the States uh, and begin training to fly in the Pacific. Uh, Dad indicated he uh, had intended to fly, wanted to continue to fly, and therefore he would take the option of going back to the States and learning uh, the, the tail gunner trade on B-29 super fortresses and go to the Pacific. The day that I got to spend with your dad uh, several years ago, and he was telling me his whole story, and I'll one of my one of my best memories of of our conversation is he was telling me that he was going to go back and become a tail gunner on a B29 and I I asked him I said did you really want to go and be a tail gunner on a B29 after you got shot down in Europe on a B17 and he said of course I didn't want to do that but it's what you had to do a sense of duty that he had and to me, that was amazing to hear him say that. I think that was very common. Again, as I mentioned early on with, with a lot of the youth, it was a, um, a team concept of, I don't want to let the other guy down. I signed up for this. Uh, certainly when you were assigned to a crew, uh, you bonded as, as, um, as somewhat as brothers. I mean, brothers in war, at least. And so it was the issue of not wanting to let down the other guy. And I think that combined with a sense of duty of defending uh, the United States and the free world, I think that uh, that really did play a key part. It wasn't about heroes. It was about people, uh, just regular run of the mill people from across the United States, from across every financial strata, every, you know, every little hamlet, every big city. You got to meet other people and, and know each other as Americans. And there was no heroism in that. That was just a sense of duty, just like you said, Tom. Yeah, and uh, to me, your dad was a hero for sure, all that he went through. And I'm so glad I got to spend some time with him before he passed away. Uh, yeah. It was a real special day that I got to spend with him. Uh, Jeremy took, took, it was the two of us, we went to visit him. And it's something I'll never forget.
I, I want well, to glad you could do that, Tom. Yeah, glad I, it was so great. It was, I'll just never forget it. Um, I could spend another hour with you, but I, I want to end this interview by you talking about the 95th Memorials Bomb Group, the 95th Bomb Group Memorials Foundation. Um, it's something that I've been connected with on social media for a while. Um, I know you're one of the past presidents of that group. And can you just tell us about that, why that exists, and what the mission is of that group? You bet, Tom. And, and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to put in the plug for the 95th Bomb Group Memorials Foundation. It, it's, it's basically the offshoot of the Veterans Association that, were, that was made up of, of these guys when they returned from the war. You know, some 40 years later, 1985, uh, these guys decided, you know, we experienced a lot together. Let's get back together. And they began reunions at that point. And it was called the 95th Bond Group Association, made up purely of veterans. Um, strangely enough, there were a lot of us um, baby boomers that, that asked the question, what did you do in the war, Daddy? And out of that, uh, what happened was uh, legacy members, uh, blood relatives, began thinking, maybe we need to have our own organization. And so we expanded that to be... Um, anybody interested in 95th, whether you were relatives or just friends or just people interested. And um, in 2004, the, uh, the veterans turned over the reins and uh, dissolved their association into the 95th Bomb Group Memorials Foundation. Our, our mission uh, is to, in fact, educate the public on all of the service and uh, the activities of the 95th Bomb Group during World War II. And 95th, is representative of every other bomb group or fighter group that was there in England uh, fighting the Nazi regime. So there are a number of organizations. This one just happens to be ours. And, um, you know, we're delighted to have people join it. We've got uh, memorials uh, now around the world. Uh, at the original base in Horham is the Red Feather Club, which has been, been uh, rebuilt. Uh, it was the Enlisted Men's Club uh, from World War II, and it's been turned into a museum. Uh, Val and Tony Albro, who were a private individual, a private, uh, a private farm, uh, they, in fact, rebuilt a portion of the 95th Bomb Group uh, Hospital of their, with their own funds. So there's a, an entire complex area back in Horham where you can see where these men were and a museum that holds artifacts and uniforms and written up stories and pictures. And uh, it's just a, it's a great place to to go and see literally where they were, where they were based as young men. And the 95th Bomb Group Memorials Foundation, which is the U.S. side, um, we hold reunions. Uh, used to be annually, as more and more of the veterans passed, uh, we usually try to have a reunion every year or two and try to pick a spot that, that's, that you know, provides interest to families because the, the real challenge is trying to get the next generation and the next generation to understand the sacrifices uh, that these men made and understand their service and their stories and pass them on generation to generation. Um, that's what it, this is made up of. So um, that's what it's all about. And I'd encourage anybody to take a look at the 95th Bomb Group Memorials Foundation website, um, www.95thbg.org. And um, you'll see, a, you'll see a, a lot. You'll see a little um, synopsis of the history. You can do research on names, on planes, on missions. Um, it's just a fun thing to do. And yes, I had the incredible honor of, of being a president of that organization for a while. And, and now I help do research. So uh, that's my bid uh, to all those that might see this. Um, get involved. Uh, understand the history that uh, our parents or grandparents uh, were a part of and, and, and what their service was about during that time of life. Because remember, these were just young men, uh, average age being between 19 and 23. And if you were a 30-year-old or more, you were considered an old man in that war. Well, we will make sure we link to that website on our website. So when we post this interview, uh, there'll be an easy link to get to that. That'll be on abc17news.com. Um, is that something that anybody can join? Do you have to be a family member to join? Who, who's able to join that group? Anyone that's got an interest in, in World War II um, history is welcome to join, Tom. There, there's no limitation there. It's uh, uh, family members, friends, interested historians. And um, uh, 
uh, we're, we're very proud to be part of the 13th Combat Wing, as I mentioned earlier, in that the 95th Bomb Group, the 100th Bomb Group, and the 390th Bomb Group, to the best of my knowledge, are the only three groups that belong to a combat wing that all three have a museum back on the original base in England. So um, um, it, it's it's just it's it's an interesting thing to do. And I would say anyone interested in that time in history, join one of those organizations. Uh, nominal fees for a dues like thirty five dollars a year kind of thing. So it's certainly worth it, I think. And obviously, I'm a little bit biased, but uh, there are certainly some interesting stories out there. Last question. Um, I want you to give me a 60 second, um, elevator speech on who your dad is, who your dad was to you. Um, dad would be, as you probably put it to me, a hero in the sense of what he went through as a young man, what he endured, um, and the mental struggles that he suffered later in life that would be linked uh, and probably called today PTSD. Um, but knowing that dad was willing to take those risks and, and played that part in a, in a war that uh, uh, needed to be won by the Allies, that's my dad. And he and my mom, uh, you know, formed a team that uh, certainly gave me an appreciation for history uh, mom's curiosity gene always got me into the how and why, and, and and dad just seemed to me to be a brave guy that was willing to do that to 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 serve his country, and all the excitement in my eyes that that must have accompanied him, and all of the fearful points that he had to endure going through that time as a young man in the 1940s. So, yep, dad would be a hero to me, just like the entire Max Wilson crew, every one of them. Uh, were heroes to me. And they would be the first to tell you, no, they weren't the heroes. The heroes are the ones uh, that didn't get to come back. The ones that are below white crosses and white stars of David in the, uh, in the cemeteries in Europe. Um, those are the true heroes. Well, Gerald, those people and, and guys that did make it back, we need to remember all of those guys because uh, it's, it's because of what they did that we can sit here now and have this conversation. And I'm so thankful to spend this time with you. There's so much more I would love to cover and maybe someday we will, but I am so thankful for your time today. And uh, someday I wanna sit down and uh, have a beer with you and we'll get deeper into these things. I uh, appreciate it all, Tom. Thanks much. And again, thank you so much for honoring these brave veterans that. Uh, are you know passing away uh, now that they're in their 90s so uh, I appreciate you and 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 the television station being sure you're keeping these kind of stories in front of the next generations that's critical to not forget the past well thank uh, we you need to learn from it not ignore it and not rewrite it well I really appreciate you taking time to be part of this because without you uh, this story will not be it, we're not going to be able to make it what it's going to be and your, the information you've been able to give us is so helpful. And just thank you so much for that. Thanks for your time today, Gerald. We'll see you, you, bet, we'll see you soon.